Unfortunately, I really don't have time to um, introduce him properly, but what I, suffice it to say, Dr. Forsmark has been a, a leader in pancreatology for 30 years, and he's been the chief of GI in Gainesville for 20 years at least or so, and you won't find a mentor in advanced endoscopy who works harder uh, for his mentees or thinks more about his mentees. And with that, I'll uh, let Dr. Forsmark talk about a research collaboration in pancreatitis. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. I'll have to pay you later for that introduction. <clears throat> you know, um, Melina, as you were standing up here, I said, my, she has such lovely posture. I wonder where that comes from. And then I looked at the horse and I said, that understands. So I'm going to try to stand <laughs> so I don't slump as much as I usually do. Um, so my uh, 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 goal in the next uh, uh, 15 or so minutes is to talk a little bit about uh, the power of working in a group and working as part of a, a consortia. So I wanted to just sort of, um, you've heard a lot, you heard from Melina about the post um, uh, consortia, you heard from George about Apprentice, you heard from David about a CAPER. There are lots of groups out there that you can join and that can help you facilitate your career. This is some of the ones on the left that I sort of, uh, that you've heard about and they've been quite successful. Probably the Dutch Pancreatitis Study Group has been the most successful. They consolidated uh, clinicians and clinical investigators across an entire country to answer a lot of important questions. Uh, but there's uh, these large pediatric groups um, that Mark Lowe helped found, the Inspire and Inspire Two. There's the old Midwestern multi-center pancreatic study group that David Whitcomb started, and then it's its progeny, NAPS and NAPS2 and NAPS-CV. Uh, there's a recent consortium, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, the CPDPC, um, which many of the members uh, are in this room. There's Apprentice, there's Episod, and there's many, many others in many different countries. And the questions that these consortium can address are uh, much bigger questions than we have been able to sort of even consider answering in the past. So in the last 10 years, we've learned a lot about you know, what are the genes that predispose to pancreatitis? What are some of the mechanisms? You know, how does pain present? How can we manage it? Uh, how can we manage acute pancreatitis? And so I just bring this forward as many of the questions you can't answer alone, and Darwin made this point, you have to answer as part of a group because the diseases that we study are relatively rare. And so these are many of the groups uh, that have answered many important questions. Um, but as you've heard already in the, the lectures uh, yesterday and today, there are so many more questions left to, to ask and answer. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about the CPDPC, which is um, a platform that I think all of you can tap into into the future. So this is a, a consortium of 10 universities which grew out of um, sort of two parallel um, uh, uh, areas of work. One was through NIDDK, and they sponsored a series of workshops over a number of years that looked at chronic pancreatitis and diabetes and the interconnection between these diseases. Um, and then some parallel uh, interest from the part of the National Cancer Institute really thinking about pancreatic cancer and the role it was going to be playing in the future and how we might improve the management of patients. And so those two efforts sort of can uh, consolidate in this consortium um, and we were sort of given some goals and objectives when this was formed and this is just a list it's a lot to read but the bottom line is that uh, the consortium was formed to study the relationships between pancreatic cancer diabetes and chronic pancreatitis and I'll show you why those connections are so interesting and so clinically impactful but the basic structure of the consortium is that we're going to establish very large cohorts of patients and these patients are going to be very deeply phenotyped that is we're going to know a lot about their history their ongoing um, evolution of disease and we're also going to have lots of biospecimens and Darwin mentioned this we're going to have blood we're going to have stool we're going to have saliva we're going to have imaging we're going to have pancreatic fluid so uh, anything you could possibly want to study in these cohorts is going to be available in sort of a large biorepository. So the combination of the deeply phenotype patients and a very robust biospecimen 
uh, resource and then follow up over time to determine what happens to those patients. So that's the basic organization of this uh, consortium. And eventually all of this data that's being collected, all of this information from patients is going to be in a biorepository that other investigators, I hope many of you in this room, want to study and analyze. And the if you think about it, I mean, the reason we're sort of interested in NIH and um, is interested in this is this sort of idea that there are these three conditions which are related. And if we understand the relationships, we can leverage that for better outcome for patients. So we know that, for instance, chronic pancreatitis is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer. We know that chronic pancreatitis can cause diabetes by destroying islet cells. On the other hand, we know that long-standing diabetes is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer and for chronic pancreatitis. We know that some patients with pancreatic cancer get a perineoplastic form of diabetes, even though the islets appear to be intact. So if we can understand the connections between the various forms of diabetes and these di diseases, we have an opportunity, I think, to use that information for a lot of important clinical questions. All right. So this is the group um, uh, that's part of the current iteration of the consortium. We're coming up for consideration of refunding in another year or so. So the, the names may change, um, but this is the current uh, group. And again, many of the folks are in this, uh, in this meeting and you can chat with them. Uh, so just to, um, as you think sort of about, you know, what's the importance of this, of this resource? What kinds of questions can we answer? So this is one, uh, slide just sort of thinking about that. We know that a lot of patients with acute pancreatitis go on to get relapsing pancreatitis. We know that many of those go on to get chronic pancreatitis. And we know that a subset of those with chronic pancreatitis go on to get pancreatic cancer. And so if we could understand this process and predict it, you can imagine you would have lots of opportunity for intervention to prevent outcomes. You maybe want to prevent chronic pancreatitis or you want to prevent pancreatic cancer in selected individuals. And if you knew who those people were, you could apply those, those interventions. And I just make the point that these diseases, pancreatitis in particular, is increasing across the U.S. in both kids and adults. And so these outcomes, these bad outcomes are going to be increasing. So if you understood how that process occurs, then you can intervene. And similarly, with pancreatic cancer, uh, as you all know, and you've heard, uh, our, um, we're getting slowly better in managing this condition. Then the five-year survival rate is going up very slowly, but not, uh, uh, not uh, you know, sufficiently, I think, for our patients. And so we know that the disease is lethal. We know it's lethal because it's detected late. And so if there was a way to identify somehow patients in the early stages before it was unresectable, we would hope we would have better outcomes than a patient like this with sort of a double duck sign. And we know that there are these potential markers that might, you know, these risk factors that if we could identify specific patients with chronic pancreatitis or specific patients with diabetes that were going to go on to pancreatic cancer, we might have a chance to, uh, to aim for early diagnosis. So that's sort of the framework of this particular consortium. The structure of the consortium is a series of cohorts of patients. And again, the cohorts are similar in that they're deeply phenotyped and then a robust biospecimen collection. You heard from um, Darwin about the PROCEED uh, 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 cohort, which is patients, adult patients with chronic pancreatitis, relapsing pancreatitis, possible chronic pancreatitis that are followed over prolonged periods of time. I'll tell you a little bit about the new onset diabetes or NOD cohort. This is focused on the connection between uh, diabetes and pancreatic cancer. There's a large pediatric working group, which you've heard a little bit about, the INSPIRE cohorts. And then uh, finally, the fourth group, which is trying to study the mechanisms of diabetes in various different pancreatic diseases. So these are the cohorts of patients for which data will be available for future study. And the idea, really, of all these cohorts, this is just an example that um, Darwin and Diraj made from the PROCEED cohort. The idea is that as you're collecting this data and these cohorts and you're following them over time and you're determining outcomes, there's lots of opportunity for all sorts of studies 
surrounding this to gain mechanistic insights into the particular diseases. And many of these types of studies are ongoing as the cohorts are being assembled. So there's an opportunity for many of you to participate in those kinds of studies, even though the cohort recruitment's not finished yet. So Darwin showed you this. I just, this is an example. This is the Proceed cohort. It's a group of patients, some of whom have obvious chronic pancreatitis, some of whom are likely to get chronic pancreatitis, some who may get chronic pancreatitis, and some who just have something that sort of looks like chronic pancreatitis, like a chronic abdominal pain syndrome. And so to figure out whether a biomarker actually works, you need that whole spectrum of patients. Um, and I'll show you just a couple examples of that. So this is Proceed. Uh, you heard a lot about the INSPIRE cohorts, large population, pediatric patients. And this uh, study has already answered a lot of questions about, you know, why do kids get pancreatitis? What's the burden of disease? What kind of strategies might be employed to manage these patients? So this is the INSPIRE cohort. Uh, and it's, as I said, you need sort of a, a team to work with. So we have the team of this U01, the CPDPC, but INSPIRE has an even bigger team that goes uh, outside the US to many centers across the world, which are recruiting patients and putting them into this, this same um, a, a repository. We have the nuance at diabetes. So why would we, what's the sort of story there? And the story is that um, this is a very large population of patients who we think are at risk for pancreatic cancer but don't yet have evidence of pancreatic cancer, at least not clinical features. So this is sort of a, um, a cohort which is sort of framed with this cartoon and that is if you take patients above the age of 50 who develop diabetes above the age of 50, about 1% of those people, the diabetes is a perineoplastic phenomenon of pancreatic cancer. So within that population, 1% have pancreatic cancer, and the pancreatic cancer is not yet clinically symptomatic. So that if you could figure out a biomarker to identify that subgroup, or to make the group somewhat smaller, then you might have a chance of getting early detection by having a biomarker in somebody, let's say, with new onset diabetes that helps identify that person as a particular risk of developing pancreatic cancer in the next, let's say, 12 to 18 months. So this is really a goal of early detection of pancreatic cancer, and it's choosing a high-risk group. And so you have to take my word for it that one out of 100 is a high-risk group uh, when you're studying uh, uh, this particular disease. So if you want to get a, enough patients with pre-symptomatic pancreatic cancer, your N has to be large. So this study is 10,000 patients with new onset diabetes above the age of 50, who are gonna be followed and we're gonna find out which of those patients ends up with pancreatic cancer in the next uh, two years. And then we're gonna have the biospecimens available from before they got symptomatic. So those things are gonna be worth their weight in gold. And this takes an even bigger team. It takes um, all of the U01 centers, it takes Kaiser, it takes other major um, integrated health systems to pull together this number of patients. But again, these are gonna be available, these samples are gonna be available to investigators um, uh, across the country. And finally, just this detect cohort. This is um, a sort of a cross-sectional cohort, but the idea here is you could have diabetes, which is, let's, let's say, type two, long-standing. You could have diabetes, which is due to chronic pancreatitis, due to destruction of the islets. Or you could have diabetes associated with pancreatic cancer, which, which is a perineoplastic phenomenon. And the mechanisms of those three types of diabetes might be entirely different. We hope they are. And there might be a way to identify those mechanisms and then to see a patient with new onset diabetes, let's say, do a test and say, do you fit into the chronic pancreatitis mechanism? the pancreatic cancer mechanism, or the type 2 mechanism. And if you could figure that out, obviously, that would help in uh, identifying pancreatic cancer early. So that's what this cohort is going to be about. They're using mixed meal testing um, and then blood sample collection afterwards. So the, the 
the cohorts are ongoing. Uh, parallel to this is all sorts of ancillary studies, and these are things you all can uh, hopefully be able to uh, participate in. You can apply to the consortium to utilize some of the specimens and do these ancillary studies in conjunction with one of the PIs. And we have lots of them. Many of them actually been funded at this point, and they're looking at all sorts of um, um, uh, different aspects of the uh, relationship between chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic cancer, and diabetes. And these are just some uh, examples. And by design, everything's harmonized across this. So the case report forms, the data collection elements, the sample processing, the biospecimen processing and storage, everything's the same across all of the cohorts. And so that was by design so that these sort of, sort of interlocking pieces of a large uh, research um, uh, 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 resource really for all of us. And I just make the point that um, not only are the, is the data collection harmonized, but many of the ancillary studies are harmonized. So they're, we're doing the same thing in kids as we are in adults, for instance, in certain of these uh, studies. So again, that'll make, I think, the results more applicable or more widespread. So one of the things that we are trying to do, as you might imagine from all of this, is figure out biomarkers, things which predict certain outcomes. That's what we really want to develop. And the question is, you know, I've been in this business for decades, as have many other people in the audience, is why don't we already have really good biomarkers? Why don't we have a test we can do that can tell us if somebody with chronic unexplained abdominal pain is going to turn out to develop chronic pancreatitis in five years? Why don't we have that test? You know, why don't we have a test which tells me if somebody with chronic pancreatitis is going to get diabetes or going to get exocrine insufficiency or going to get cancer? I don't have those tests, obviously. Um, so <coughs> biomarkers are really form the basis for the future of precision medicine. You have to predict what's going to happen so you can intervene and try to treat that particular, uh, particular outcome. And the reason we don't have biomarkers is that it's hard to get useful biomarkers. Um, you want a biomarker that everybody can use across the country, right? I mean, that's what you want. And so to do that, it has to go through FDA approval. And to go through FDA approval, there's a series of very rather onerous steps you have to take. And the reason we don't have biomarkers is because nobody's been able to do this effectively in this field. So you have to prove that the, t the machine you're using is accurate at measuring the, whatever biomarker you're choosing. And so there's lots of things. You have to have limit of detection. You have to have sample stability. You have to have very rigorous standard operating procedures so that everybody does it the same way and so it's reliable from lab to lab to lab. You have to have lots of data on clinical performance. So you have to say, I'm going to test it not only in people that have the disease, but in lots of other people that might be mistaken for having that disease. And you have to prove that it differentiates those groups. You have to s analyze, well, what's the risk of a false positive? Does that mean somebody goes to unnecessary surgery? Does it mean somebody gets an unnecessary CAT scan? What's the cost of that? And then you have to have a derivation population you have to have a validation population, and you have to have a normal range population. So nobody has that. So that's why we don't have biomarkers, and then you have to go through the whole FDA process. So this, um, this U01, I think, is going to provide the infrastructure, the basic data that would allow us to take the thought of a biomarker to the actual clinical use of a biomarker that, that could be used uh, by all clinicians. So that's... Um, I think where, where we're heading. And as just an example, a bunch of us in this U01 sort of said, well, what biomarkers are there for chronic pancreatitis? So we analyzed, you know, 700 articles and, you know, more than 90 different biomarkers. And we sort of uh, said, well, what's, what's promising? And the first thing we discovered is of all those uh, biomarkers and all those publications that none of them have actually been validated. So we can't really tell what's promising. We came up with a long list, which thankfully you can't read, but the, um, um, <coughs> the far column was sort of, is it validated? And there are no X's in there, is it validated <laughs> uh, kind of thing. So we have lots of little small studies in animals, in small groups of patients. You know, this test, that test, it kind of works, it looks promising, but we have no biomarkers because it's, there's nothing, there's no data set big enough to do this except 
uh, we're hoping that our data set will be big enough to do that. And again, it's going to be something that's available to the broad range of investigators. And our uh, consortium has lots of other partners, and I want to particularly reach out to the National Pancreas Foundation, but others as well who um, have been so supportive of uh, helping this uh, project sort of launch. And Bill Go for publishing almost an entire um, <laughs> uh, issue related to this, um, this effort. So thank you, Bill. So I'll just finish by saying, um, as you've heard a lot about the power of working in a group, the different groups that have formed here, the different groups that are out there that you might be able to join. Um, remember, the diseases we study are rare. That means none of us have enough patients to actually answer these important questions. Uh, we don't have a great understanding of mechanisms, so sometimes we don't even know what questions to ask. Uh, that's why we have to rely on basic scientists and translational investigators to help us frame those questions. Uh, we don't have very effective interventions. Uh, we oftentimes can't even achieve consensus. You've seen all these practice guidelines where they vote on, you know, should we do this, should we do that, and usually the level of agreement is moderate at best. So the only way to fix this is with a team approach, and so each of you has to sort of think about which team you're going to join. Find a team. Uh, many teams have formed at this forum, so talk to your other um, uh, uh, residents and fellows and students about whether you can answer questions. Uh, connect with a scientist at your institution about answering some of these basic questions. And my one piece of advice maybe is, um, so find a team. Uh, all you have to be is willing, really. And if you're willing and you're willing to work, then people will want you to be part of the team. But uh, second thing is that if you say you're going to do something, you better do it. So follow through on your commitments. And if you have the willingness and, the, and you follow through on your commitments, I mean, in a few years, one of you will be up here giving this talk instead of me. Thanks. And, and thanks, Dr. Forsmark. And to me, that's why it's so exciting to go into pancreatology, because we're on the cusp. And the people in this room, you can, you know, make one of these huge breakthroughs. There's so much left to be done. And, and we're close, and we need your help, and, and you can be up there telling us about your exciting advancements in biomarkers. Thanks, Chris. Uh, even for me, who is part of this group, this is a wonderful summary of the whole thing. But uh, I'm just thinking, and as you're talking, many of these young fellows are probably very early on faculty, 